The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fourth chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 25 and read through chapter 5, verse 2. So Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. So then, putting away all falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you, our rock, our redeemer, our savior and friend. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So what makes a community? What does it take for a community to exist? I suppose one might give sort of a practical answer and say, well, geography, right? A measurable amount of land and space for several people to inhabit wherein they might cross paths from time to time as they travel to work, They go to school, they go to the store, they go to church. I mean, after all, you've seen them. I know you have. I've seen them. I see them every day. Those little green signs on Nisbet Lake Road, Pleasant Valley Road. This little green rectangle says, Williams Community. Most of you know far better than I do where the line for the Williams Community really is. When I moved here, we just live on Little John Road, but I remember when we moved into our house Listening to folks say, I wish you just could have moved into the community. (laughs) Five minutes away with traffic. (laughs) I've been told a time or two about the difference between Cedar Springs, Williams, and Webster's Chapel. So I could suppose one might be able to claim that a community is defined by the borders drawn around it, the green signs, the brick entryways that tell those who are traveling through that they are now entering the Williams community. You're now traveling through Gateway community. That was one down in Enterprise. Or you're now entering Whispering Pines community. So I suppose if somebody said, what makes a community? Somebody might say, well, geography. But, but I'm not so sure geography is a good way to make community. So maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something else more, I don't know, um, unavoidable, like biology. Maybe biology is what it takes to make a community. A group of people who all share some measurable portion of genetic material. I remember when we lived in Texas and I was pastoring the little Osage Baptist Church just across the Coriel County line. We lived on the other side of Lake Waco uh, in a little, little place called Spiegelville. And the drive to Osage was about 30 or 40 minutes one way. And so we would drive either down Highway 6, sometimes down US 84. But eventually we'd come through Crawford, Texas and turn on the farm to market road 185 heading out to Osage. 
And you knew, you knew you really were arriving in Osage when on FM 185 you started to notice the same names on the mailboxes. You started to see the same W in the middle of maybe a star over someone's garage or over the gate that went over the cattle guard to their driveway. Because there was one family that owned most of the land out there, one of the biggest farming families in Texas. And brothers, sisters, cousins, nieces, and nephews, they all lived really within walking distance of one another, and most of them all worked in the family farming business. And I remember one time having a conversation with one of the members of that family, one of the members at Osage, and she said to me, Oh yeah, the whole family, we live right here in about a five-mile radius. You could say, our little family is a community. Relation." Biology, marital connections. I guess you could say that's what it takes, but, but I'm not so sure that's a good way to make community either. After all, right now, if I asked you, you could probably think of some folks you're kin to you don't want in your community. So maybe it's something else. The pollsters, those folks, they'll, they'll tell you it's some things like socioeconomics, how much money one makes, how much education one possesses. They'll even say, well, it's things like ethnicity or or race or creed and belief, maybe even religion. I mean, that seems to be the most readily available way we define community, isn't it? I mean, you've heard phrases, right, like the black community, the Hispanic community, the evangelical community, the gay community. Like, it just seems like that's the way to do it, right? Or how how about whenever someone talks about a place like Mountain Brook outside of Birmingham or Buckhead outside of Atlanta, I feel like there's some unwritten rule that when you talk about Mountain Brook, you have to say, you know, it's the richest zip code in Alabama. (coughs) Or Buckhead outside, it's one of the wealthiest zip codes in the southeast. Which is true. But if you've been there, you know right outside of their little green sign, right where their zip code ends, (coughs) there are people struggling to make ends meet. And folks standing on the off-ramp of I-20 holding cardboard signs looking for some help. Of course, you can drive around in big cities and catch a glimpse of it in the other direction. I see it when I go to McAfee in Atlanta all the time. Giant Korean supermarket in the middle of a shopping center where none of the signs are written in English. A strip mall full of restaurants, and every single one of them offers a halal special for lunch. If you want to get a little closer to home, I used to hear it all the time and still do. People talk about West Anniston as if the devil himself had moved into one of those crumbling houses on Gurney Avenue. So while it may be easy for census collections, sociological studies, and if we're honest, our own sense of comfort and identity, I don't think things like socioeconomic status, race or ethnicity, or even religion, are good measures of what make a community. And to tell you the truth, to tell you the truth, I don't think there is any good way to make a community. Because on the one hand, you just can't make community. What I mean is you can't just go around collecting folks who live in a certain radius, folks with the same last name, the same color eyes, similar annual incomes or education, and then say to all of them, we are now a community because we got all this stuff in common. That's just not how it works. But the main reason I don't think there's any good way to make community is because every way we may ever devise to make community only really makes division. In other words, attempting to make community can't help but make divisions. You've got to include some people in the circle, and when you do that, you've got to keep some out, right? And what's more, most of us, really all of us, don't have any choice when it comes to what community or communities in which we are included. So maybe, maybe I've asked the wrong question. Maybe I've asked the wrong question. Maybe we shouldn't ask, how do we make community? But instead, we should ask, how do we live in this community to which we belong? With the understanding that the actual community we belong to is humankind. Now that, as far as I can tell, is what the author of this text, let's just call him Paul for 
ease sake is driving at. In fact, I think that's what the whole of the gospel is driving at. And the question isn't about what we can do to create community. Rather, it's about how we, as these followers of Jesus, are called to live within the communities of which we are already a part. So with that in mind, how do we do that? If that's the question we ask, let's ask it. How do we live as Christians in this broader community of humankind? Now, I know many Christians who have their own answers already. Right? There are those people who'd like to say, that we are the gatekeepers of the community, the moral check on society's richer excesses. We decide who's in and who's out, who's right and who's wrong. We Christians are, by the very nature of our blessedness and chosenness, the ones who get to determine the social direction of our country and our world. I don't know. It'd be nice, but I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we are the ones who get to stand at the door and check everyone's ID. Maybe we are the ones who get to ask all the questions, to run the background checks, to give the theological quizzes disguised as everyday conversation. You know what I'm talking about. You go to the parts store to buy an alternator. Maybe you do, I don't know. And you get there and they hand it to you and the guy says some odd off-subject off thing because he's probing you. Is this guy part of my community? Maybe that's who we are. Maybe we're the ones who scan the social media pages of those who want to try to get in to be sure we don't see anything too liberal, anything too conservative, too laced with profanity, or too ignorant to even make sense. Maybe. But honestly, I, I sort of doubt it. After all, no one checked my credentials. I don't remember if they did. Do you? Anybody check yours at the door? So maybe we're supposed to be less gatekeepers and more like law enforcement. That is to say, maybe those of us who've already made it to this side are the ones who have to make sure that those who are coming over here with us are doing all the right things and putting all the wrong things away. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've come across somebody who reads Scripture that way those folks who, when Jesus said, forgive someone seven times, 70 times, you know what they're doing? They got a little notebook that's 394 of 490. They're taking him literally. They're keeping tabs. You know the folks, right? They're the ones who, after you've told them, well, after church on Sunday, I think we're all going to go out to Baja for lunch. And then they sort of casually say, oh, well, I never eat out on Sundays because it makes people work on the Sabbath. Just to try to belittle you just a little bit. Those folks who see the Bible as a rule book, as an instrument for determining whether or not one is in line or out of step with God. And don't get me wrong, the Bible is a rich library of all sorts of literature ranging from poetry, myth, history, and law. But I just can't imagine that what we are called to do is to commit it to memory so we can catch folks or even ourselves in an act of non-compliance. I think it'd be easy to even read this text from Ephesians that way as a list of do's and don'ts, a moralistic review of the author's ideas about living in the community of faith in the late first century. I mean, those final verses of chapter 4 read almost like something borrowed right out of the book of Leviticus, don't they? At least in their matter-of-fact legalistic presentation. So then, putting away falsehood, let us speak of truth. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Thieves must give up stealing. Let them labor. Let no, one, let no evil talk come out of your mouth. Put away from you all bitterness and be kind to one another, tender heart. It sounds like something you're just going down the list. Checking the boxes. I mean, they're really beautiful words, actually. I mean, they, they don't come out of Leviticus. They come out of the rich tradition of the New Testament. But I can't help but think how those sort of words are weaponized by legalists. How such words may be taken to their ultimate literal end. Not so much so that they may be put into practice. Rather that they may be used as a way of judging the righteousness of others over against ourselves. Because isn't that what we do? I mean, no matter whether we're in a social club, a fraternal organization, even at our jobs or schools, there are those instances where we are tempted and perhaps even give in to that temptation. 
to use rules not to keep ourselves in line, but to use against someone else. To call out someone else's infraction is greater than whatever small, insignificant thing we've committed. We find ourselves saying things like, sure, I may have told a little lie, but at least I'm not lazy. Or maybe we'll say, I'm not saying I did or I didn't, but if a man looks twice at a woman in a certain way, at least he's not gossiping about his neighbors. Or one I've heard at a time or two goes something like this, I know we're all sinners, but I'm not that kind of sinner. As if God has grades and ranks, right, for sinners. It's what we do. It's how we naturally find ourselves trying to live in this broad community of humankind. If we don't get to make our communities, at least we get to decide what position we get to hold in them. And that's what we tell ourselves. And I suppose, I suppose we could tell ourselves that and always be in the right. Because we can. We can tell ourselves that there are laws, there are rules, there are certain expectations to which one must hold in order to be a successful, functioning, and welcomed part of this community called humanity. We can tell ourselves that God has given us these rules, this book, this Bible, this disposition to common sense and moral righteousness in order to differentiate between the good guys and the bad guys. And I suppose we have every right to climb into the captain's chair, into the judge's seat, to stand at the gate of existence and decide who's in and who's out, to call attention to the sins of others by pointing the void of that sin in our own lives. I suppose we could take these words from Ephesians and run with them, telling others to tell the truth, telling others don't be mad unless it's for the right reasons and don't be mad for very long. We could tell others you need to get out and work and earn a living. We could tell others to not gossip, to stay away from vile talk, to put away all kinds of evil things and just be nice. None of those things are bad. And I hope we do tell people that. But just like trying to make community inevitably leads to division, trying to live in any literalistic, legalistic sense of the law of Scripture only leads to judgment and condemnation. And not just our judgment and condemnation of someone else, but our very own judgment and condemnation. So what then? Come back to the question, how do we live in this common community of humankind of which we are inextricably a part? How do we live with one another if we can't draw boundaries, if we can't put up signs, if we can't issue correctives, if we can't call out each other's transgressions? How do we live in this community if we can't do that? If I can't say I'm better than you, how are we ever going to live in this community? Well, it's right there, isn't it? It's right there in the text. I mean, it's not in chapter 4, but we put all that chapter and verse stuff in there. I don't think it was meant as a break. That's why it's not a break here. I mean, Paul gives all of these direct instructions about how to talk, how to interact with one another, about what to say and what not to say, about how to feel and for how long, but then it turns there in chapter 5, verses 1 or 2, when 1 and 2, when he says... Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Live in love. Now You've heard me say something along those lines before, but I want you to understand something. This isn't some flower child philosophy of just letting people do as they please, of just letting people alone so long as they don't hurt anybody. This life of love isn't about treating everyone as if you're some sort of inoculated nanny forced to like them because it's your job, because the Bible says so, to just tolerate them because that's what God wants you to do. No, to live in love is to, as the verse goes on to say, love as Christ loved which means to live a life in complete service to others without regard for whatever community they claim to be a part of, to live a life of service even even to the point of death, to love others so fully and completely 
that it costs you everything. Now, can I tell you something? If I haven't lost you, if you're still with me, can I tell you something? It's not easy. And I don't mean that like a Rubik's Cube isn't easy. I mean it's not easy. It's not easy because I don't know if you know this, but people do lie. Now, I know we're in church and none of us do, but people do lie. And they lie about you and they lie to you. It's not easy because people do actually let the sun go down on their anger. They let several suns go down on their anger until that anger forms into a grudge that causes them to see uh, not a person, but something else. It's not easy because some folks steal. Because some folks are lazy. Because some people speak evil about everyone and especially about you. And a lot of folks are bitter. A lot of folks are filled with wrath and anger over things they can't change and the fear of the unknown and inevitable. So friends, this thing isn't easy. This calling to live in love as Christ loved us is not easy. It's unnatural to live such a life of service to others even to the point of death. It's not easy. Because if I'm honest with you, on the list of people worth dying for, I don't think I could fill out half a page. Could you? That's not easy. Because if we're honest, we just can't come to the thinking about, well, who is worth dying for? And that's why it's absolutely necessary. It's absolutely necessary that those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, imitators of God, have to strive to do it. Because until we can look into the eyes of every single person who crosses our paths and see Jesus, until we can see in every stranger a brother or sister, until we realize that all the communities we create, all the lines that we draw, all the fights that we fight are just foolish and futile. The world will need us to stand up to say, I'm willing to give up my want so someone else can have their need. I'm willing to sacrifice my well-being so that someone else may have their dignity. I'm willing to die so that someone else may live. Until we fully take hold of the truth that we are all brothers and sisters in this world, until we fully take hold of that truth that we are, as Paul says, members of one another, we'll need to show each other what that truth really looks like. As we live, as we strive to live in love. The love with which Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God without checking our ID at the door, without wondering if we've checked enough boxes on the list, without wondering if we're the right color or the right creed or the right ethnicity, Jesus gave himself up for us and calls us to live a life in the same sort of love. In this great community of humankind, the koinonia of God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit, Lord, help us, God, to understand that we are members of one another. God, that all of your children, all the people this earth are our brothers and sisters, and you call us, Lord, to love them, to live lives of love, with the same love that you showed us. And God, we know it is not easy. And if we're honest with ourselves, Lord, we don't want to do it. So give us your Holy Spirit to show us the way, to remind us, convict us, Lord, when we fail, but not so that we may be down 
but so that you may call us to stand back up and to keep going, striving with each new day to live more fully this life of love. So Holy Spirit, move in our presence. Speak to our hearts. Show us, Lord, the ways, perhaps, God, that we have failed to live lives of love. Help us, Lord, to confess them to you, to ask your forgiveness, to feel the empowerment of your Holy Spirit calling us on from here on after. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.